from KSAT 12. The Night Beat starts right now. It is a first in more than a week. San Antonio much quieter than the nights of peaceful protests the Alamo City has seen. It comes the same day George Floyd was laid to rest in Houston. We know another protest is scheduled for tomorrow, but San Antonio did see protests earlier in the day. There was one woman we caught up with that says she wants her message to extend beyond the daily events. The latest coming up, but first. New on the night being an arrest made more than a year later. Police say he's accused of grabbing a Leon Valley councilwoman, leaving her shaken. 78 year old Yolen Yarnell is charged with simple assault of the elderly. Police say he's accused of grabbing Leon Valley councilwoman Monica Alcocer during a council meeting, then telling her, quote, I need to talk to you about being nice, end quote. The court records show a warrant was issued for Yarnell's arrest in late March. Officials have not said why it took more than two months for him to be taken into custody. Alcocer is one of two city council members facing a recall election in Leon Valley in November. A rise in deaths tonight amid the coronavirus crisis. Bear County now reporting 80 people have died from COVID-19. That's an increase of two from yesterday. We now have 3,513 cases confirmed, which is 180 more than yesterday. More than 2,000 people have recovered from the illness, leaving 1,311 people still fighting the disease. 107 of those people are in the hospital tonight. And when it comes to cases where no symptoms were present, Bear County has classified 701 of its COVID-19 cases as what they call asymptomatic. Metro Health is taking a look at this classification, but it was confusing comments from a World Health Organization official that caused a lot of controversy. It was suggested asymptomatic people only rarely spread COVID-19, but then a clarification from the WHO. Tiffany Huerta speaks with how the city is responding. My initial thoughts was that um, someone misspoke. Dr. Georges Benjamin, the executive director at the American Public Health Association, says he was not surprised when WHO had to clarify comments on asymptomatic spread of COVID-19 today. We know that there is um, substantial asymptomatic spread, which is why we ask people to wear masks. Um, both people who are infected and people who are not infected. What I was referring to yesterday in the press conference were a very few studies, some two or three studies that have been published that actually try to follow asymptomatic cases, so people who are infected over time, and then look at all of their contacts and see how many additional people were infected. And that's a very small subset of studies. Metro Health sent us a statement on the issue saying in part, quote, Throughout this response, public health officials have had to adapt to new and changing circumstances. We now know that individuals can carry COVID-19 without any symptoms. In fact, our team just concluded a asymptomatic testing study that will shed light on the rate of asymptomatic infections and what that means for our community's public health response, end quote. Metro Health says they plan to share the results of the study with the public this summer. We haven't changed our position on asymptomatic, which is that we don't know what the prevalence is in our community. That's why we are doing that door-to-door -door random study. And um, we'll continue to proceed that with that direction and those assumptions, um, regardless of the WHO statement. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. In more protests taking place in San Antonio today. People gathering outside the Bear County District Attorney's Office speaking out against the DA not reopening cases involving three men who died after being shot by San Antonio police. The night team's Jaffney Gray was there. She spoke with one woman who says the change will start at the polls. No justice! No Protesters filled the courtyard of the Bear County District Attorney's Office today demanding three cases where black men have been killed at the hands of San Antonio police be reopened. This after District Attorney Joe Gonzalez made the announcement that there wasn't enough evidence to reopen those cases. Marquise Jones killed in 2014, Antoine Scott killed in 2016, and Charles Roundtree killed in 2018. Among the protesters, Valerie Reifert. I am a volunteer deputy registrar. Reifert spends her time during protests getting people registered to vote. Out of the 70% of registered voters in San Antonio, only about 22% showed up last time. So we really need voters to show up and show out at the polls. She says since the protests started, they've seen more people interested in exercising their right to vote. 
Since the first protest on Saturday to today, we're about 300 people registered to vote. Like others, she too is fed up by the social injustices that have happened. If you don't feel Black Lives Matter and you feel like all lives matter, if you feel like all lives matter, you should be angry too. You should be really upset about Black people getting treated so poorly for so long. Reifer says the only way change can be accomplished is if people stand together for justice and vote. It's more important now than ever because if we want to see real actionable change, we have to start with the local to the people locally who are making decisions for our everyday life. There is a reason why people fought so hard to keep us from voting. People literally died for people's right to vote. Jaffney Gray, Case at 12 News. And a reminder, the deadline to register to vote less than a week away. You have until Monday, June 15th to make sure you're registered for the runoff scheduled for July. And if you've already registered or need more information, votetexas.gov can help. Or you can call the Bear County Elections Office at 210-335-VOTE. Both Republicans and Democrats will need to decide several races, including who will hold the chair for each political party in Bear County. His death has fueled a renewed movement towards change. And today, George Floyd was laid to rest in his hometown of Houston. A six hour viewing was held yesterday and today a final farewell. Bill Barajas from our sister station KPRC was there to witness it all. Hundreds were on today's guest list, family, friends, celebrities, local and state leaders. Everyone here to pay tribute to George Floyd and say their goodbyes during his homegoing service. Everybody going to remember him around the world. He's going to change the world. Dry eyes were hard to come by. George Floyd was remembered by his family as a gentle giant, a man whose death triggered a movement. No justice, no peace. A call to action highlighted by former Vice President and Democratic presidential candidate Joe Biden. When there is justice for George Floyd, we will truly be on our way to racial justice in America. George Floyd's celebration of life. Just remember, he lasting nearly four hours. He's changed, man, changed the world. Like his name is known all over the world, not just in Third Ward, not just in Houston. The native Houstonians service then finishing up with a powerful eulogy from Reverend Al Sharpton. You called for mama, we're gonna lay your body next to hers. But I know mama's already embraced you, George. You fought a good fight. You kept the faith. You finished your course. Go on and get your rest now. The gold-plated casket was then taken away in a hearse, eventually loaded onto a horse-drawn carriage, visible to those who lined up along the procession route. The home going, finishing up here, the Houston Memorial Garden Cemetery. George Floyd, peacefully laid to rest, surrounded by those he loved. And today's celebration of life service is now in the books. The impact of George Floyd's story, though, is far from complete. Those here today say they will stand with his family until justice is served. In Houston, Bill Barajas, KSAT 12 News. It was a hot and steamy day today. We made it up to 98 for the high temperature right now. We're down to 89, but here's the big difference. Our dew point has dropped nearly 30 degrees just since 6 p.m. Dew points now at 47, so that lack of humidity actually makes the heat index work in our favor. It's 89, but when you do the calculation, it feels like 86. And there is going to be a lack of humidity in the days ahead. A cold front, believe it or not, is actually moving through town right now. We've got some 70s in the hill country. Meanwhile, still 91 in Floresville and 89 in Pleasanton. Tomorrow? Most of us waking up to temperatures in the mid 60s, a little closer to 60 degrees in parts of the hill country, including Kerrville and Comfort. More on this cold front and what we can expect the rest of the week behind it coming up. All right, thank you, Adam. Cooling centers in the city now opening up earlier, primarily because of the COVID-19 pandemic. The city says the coronavirus has left people with fewer options to seek shelter from the heat, so they began opening up six of 10 cooling centers today. Here's a list of the centers that will be open tomorrow. These libraries will be open from 10 in the morning until 5 tomorrow through Saturday. The city says those seeking relief from the heat will be able to sit in designated areas, use Wi-Fi on their own devices, but computer use will not be available. More cooling centers are set to be open next week. We have the full schedule on KSAT.com. By the way, the city is still in the process of reopening a lot of city services. At last check, the city planned to open up 11 outdoor pools and five splash pad locations starting July 3rd. 
The pandemic also having an impact on those in need of food. More seniors and more veterans are depending on food deliveries. As Stephanie Serna reports, Meals on Wheels and Soldiers Angels are now teaming up to meet that need. Mr. Jesse Salazar is an Army veteran and he's been fighting cancer for three years. So for Soldiers Angels and Meals on Wheels to reach out to him, he says it means a lot. It benefits me. Right now in, my, in this period of time, it really benefits me a lot. It's like a, like a little blessing. Meals on Wheels and Soldiers Angels have been working together to not only serve more seniors, but also more veterans. It did present a bigger challenge, so we had to, we had to think outside the box to be able to assist them uh, during this crisis. We have started delivering to isolated homebound veterans about a week ago, and it has been so much fun getting to meet these folks in our community, getting to further help the folks who have done so much for our country and for our city. As you can see, there are a lot of Meals on Wheels volunteers here picking up meals to deliver, but they can always use the help. We've been great, but gosh, we could always use more. Like I said previously, Meals on Wheels is serving way more clients than we were initially, and so we need the support. We need the help. Meals on Wheels has been delivering meals to an additional 300 seniors since March, and volunteers tell us they're glad they can help. I've been, been blessed to be protected by the veterans for many, many years, and, and so I felt like I needed to give something back to that community, and, and uh, my father-in-law was in, in the service, so um, I'm trying to honor him. Stephanie Serna, KSAT 12 News. Still ahead on the night beat, a toddler hailed a hero in Bernie. How a day of puddle jumping turned into a need to jump into action. And the latest on the Republican National Convention and how San Antonio is responding. It's coming up next on the Night Beat. A visit San Antonio apparently explored a last minute push to host a relocated Republican National Convention. But it appears the RNC is headed east to Florida. According to several reports, Jacksonville believed to be the top pick to host the Republican National Convention. On Saturday, Visit San Antonio President and CEO Cassandra Matei sent a letter to City Manager Eric Walsh saying Visit SA had been approached by local business leaders about San Antonio hosting that convention. In a statement sent to our newsroom, Matei says, quote, as Visit San Antonio's mission is to drive visitation to the city and in light of how hard the tourism and hospitality industry has been hit in recent months, we decided to gauge the city's interest in whether we should pursue a significant piece of business for our economy. That's apparently where it ended, though. The convention is expected to draw about 20,000 visitors and pump about $50 million to the host city's economy in normal years. We'll see how the pandemic plays out this year. Charlotte was originally going to host, but President Donald Trump started looking for other cities after North Carolina refused to guarantee the convention could be held without restrictions because of ongoing concerns over coronavirus. A Bernie toddler hailed as a young hero. His quick actions are attributed to helping in the rescue of his dad and sibling. It happened nearly a month ago, but tonight the firefighters who took part in the rescue welcomed him as their own. The night team's Patty Santos tells us how a day of playing in the puddles turned scary. It was all smiles and cheers for Miles Butry and his family as he met with the Bernie firefighters who helped him with the rescue. A puddle jumping rainy day on Windsor Drive on May 12th for the three year old and six year old Ella and their dad turned nearly deadly. I looked back over, my daughter was sliding down the drain. It was kind of that moment of here we go. Blake Butry ran after her. I could see her pink jacket disappear into the pipe and just went after her from there. According to the fire department, the two went underground in here into the storm drain, swapped about 250 feet into a culvert. 15 feet underground. Somehow he was able to stop himself in the chute and there was a little bit of a standing platform that was covered by water that they were able to stand on. Meanwhile, the scared toddler left behind ran home. What did you do when, when your daddy and your um, sister were in trouble? Good mom, mama. And he said, Ella fell in and my daddy went in to get her. Underground, Butry found Ella and waited. Worried Miles might be behind. And he was, but with help. About five, ten minutes later, the uh, Bernie Fire Department showed up. They were pulled to safety without injury. And although Miles was recognized as a hero, at the end of the day, you can see he's just a normal kid. One, two, three. Three, that's right. I'm starting to, I'm starting to turn four. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News.
Way to go, Miles. Well, the city is currently working on putting up gates in the storm drain to prevent this from happening again. Well, he is the longest serving city manager in one city in Texas. Now, Bernie's city manager is gearing up for his final day on the job this week. After 40 years, today, the last city meeting for Ron Bowman. Bowman started out in 1980 when the population in Bernie was just a little over 2,200. The population now more than 18,000. When he started out as an administrative assistant, he thought he'd be around for about three years before moving on. But, oh, destiny had other plans. It's where I live. It's, it's, and I, I wanted my home to be as good as it could be. So we've always tried to do things that were for the greater good of the community. He says the city has grown from about 40 staff to more than 200, including a fire and police department. His replacement, Ben Thatcher from South Lake, Texas, starts on Monday. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Let's take a live look outside right now with live cam 89 degrees. Very hot day. Ready for a little bit of relief. Yeah, and, and it's not as humid outside right yeah. now. It actually feels nice out. That's the big noticeable change now is the lack of humidity. And I know technically a cold front moved through today, though. I like to call this one a not as humid front because that's the biggest change that it's going to have on us. Our high temperature was 98 this afternoon after a morning low of 77. And that's one of the biggest changes coming behind this cool front is that morning low temperatures will be down in the mid 60s and actually running below average. Look at the highs elsewhere. Del Rio topped out at 105, Uvalde 102, even New Braunfels hit the century mark today at an even 100. All right, let's get a look at the readings right now. Some improvement out there. Bernie's looking at 77, Comfort 78, and even Bulverde at 79. Then you get down to Pleasanton, it's still 88, and even Stinson on the south side at 89, and Divine at 87, looking at 90s farther south of town. Cotula and Carrizo Springs at 93. So uh, quite a temperature contrast out there right now, but especially a difference in humidity. And there still is a little bit of a heat index, but it's nothing like it was earlier today, of course. At the peak of the day, peak heating, we had heat indices up to 111 in some locations across South Texas. So it was really sticky out there combined with the high heat. But look at the big difference in mugginess across South Texas. I mean, you get into the hill country, perfectly comfortable. Lack of humidity in the air, dew points in the 40s. Then you get down to the I-35 corridor and especially southeast of San Antonio, Pleasanton, a dew point of 78, along with Gonzales, LaGrange, 79. Big, sharp contrast, and that's this cold front that dropped in. And, yeah, it's not going to make things colder, per se, but it is really going to drop that humidity. Notice how we go through the night here with our future cast, and even early risers tomorrow will notice the lack of humidity all across South Texas. And this is actually going to stick around for an unusual amount of time, at least considering the time of year. Look at the lack of humidity. Dew points 30s, 40s, and 50s basically from tomorrow morning all the way through the weekend and into early next week. Now the cold front did pop a few showers and a few thunderstorms earlier today. One just popped up near Seguin over the past hour, but it has since fizzled out. Now we've got this better batch of showers and lightning and thunder. This thunderstorm in Frio County dumping some good rainfall there. Nothing severe, just good soaking rain and really relish all of it you can get. Those of you along the I-35 corridor in Frio County, because it's gonna be dry from here on out. So tomorrow morning, 66 degrees. We'll be running below average to start the day and then up to 92, which is seasonable. Below humidity all day, bright sunshine and a northeasterly breeze. And that lack of humidity lasts for the basically the entire seven day forecast with morning low temperatures just remaining in the mid 60s and highs low to mid 90s. So we're going to coast here for several days with very similar conditions, but unfortunately no good chance of rain anytime soon. All right. Thank you, Adam. All right. Before they head to their new digs in Disney, they get to hang out just off Hebner. Yeah, exactly. The Spurs practices that he has been closed since March. It reopened on Monday and now open for business. How are they adjusting to the restrictions? Their general manager will let us know. And a final season at Brackenridge High School for a high school coaching legend coming up.
Spurs practice facility is now open for business starting on Monday. Players and staff started reporting to their headquarters on Spurs Lane, but not without restrictions. The NBA allowing teams to return to their headquarters last month, but the Spurs decided to wait until June the 8th. Players had to arrive at scheduled times, must be screened for the coronavirus before entering the facility. We've taken a conservative approach to that um, for a number of reasons, but um, first and foremost, you know, we wanted to, to kind of see where things were going in the, in the local San Antonio market with the virus. And we wanted to, to see a downward trend um, in the positivity rates. And, and we've seen that um, over the last few weeks. And we worked closely with our local health officials to make sure um, that when we did get back in the gym, if we were to do any testing, that we weren't taking away from the local community's ability to test. When the Spurs and the NBA resume their season with a 22-team format in Orlando on July 31st, one of the possibilities may be the Spurs having to deal without their head coach sideline from the sidelines. NBA Commissioner Adam Silver has opened the possibility that coaches who are 65 years of age or older may not be allowed to be with their teams on the sidelines when the NBA season resumes in a controlled environment of the wide world of sports complex at Disney World. The reason the Center for Disease Control and Prevention says people at that age or older are more susceptible to the coronavirus. That could mean the possibility of 71-year-old head coach Greg Popovich not being allowed on the sidelines when the games resume. Spurs General Manager Brian Wright addressed that possibility as he met with reporters via Zoom and asked if he thought that would be a competitive disadvantage for the Spurs. All of that is still TBD on, on how that all plays out. Um, you know, the league is still working uh, with the Players Association on a lot of different things um, on the rules that will govern, you know, how we function during that time period to complete the season. So um, I don't want to speculate and, you know, we'll wait from for guidance on the league on on how we'll move forward um but obviously um yeah you would like your complete group there but i think the league has made it clear from the beginning that the health and safety for everybody is a priority commissioner silver has since walked back some of his comments to the nba coach association president rick carlisle admitting in some cases coaches in their 60s and 70s could be healthier than those in the 30s and 40s Workouts continue at local high schools today after the University Interscholastic League allows student athletes to return to campuses starting on Monday with guidelines in place to ensure their safety following the coronavirus. Our visit today takes us to Alamo Heights High School where the Mules held workouts for both boys and girls student athletes. Alamo Heights has a new head coach and athletic director in Ron Riddleman. He decided to leave Johnson High School after 12 seasons and move to Heights to satisfy two desires, move into administration and at the same time continue coaching. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic hiatus, this is actually the first time Coach Ritterman and his players have been together on the field. Coach Norman was great. He was an experienced coach, and uh, Coach Ritterman's the same. You know, uh, long experience. You know, great guy. I mean, from my initial impression, I'm really excited for this season. Since we still have been able to talk to him, it's been kind of easier for us to over come over to a new change. We get someone that was as good as Coach Norman, if not better, and that can help us take over and try and win state this year. All right, last season for a high school coaching legend. Next. And now that high school workouts have resumed, one longtime coach of the San Antonio area is looking at his final season at Brackenridge High School. Willie Hall has been with the Eagles for 37 years, the last 25 as their head coach after originally joining the Brackenridge staff in 1983, assuming the head coaching duties in 1995, leading the Eagles to the playoffs 15 times. Now at 64 years of age, 2020 will be his last season as the longest tenured coach. It means a lot, and you know, not just because it's my last year, but, uh, you know, this is what I've done since I was a, a youngster. And uh, I, I want to go out uh, having a great year and, and spending time with the kids. And some of that was stolen from us, but we're back. Some people get new coaches every year and stuff, but he's been here for so long. We've got, you know, build like a bond and stuff, so it's always good. And in his final season, Hall, like everybody else, is faced with new challenges due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Guidelines and restrictions that limit all workouts as he prepares to hopefully kick off the season on time. But the student athletes, they're just happy to be back on the field. It's a blessing, you know, that we all get to come back and, you know, um, build like a brotherhood because, you know, we were off for so long, finding a good back and, um, you know, you know, just be with each other. It's pretty hard because we're joking around all close up in a huddle, but now we have to stay six feet away, apart, talking from a distance. But we're, working, we're making it work. We're doing as much as we can. 
Right, glad to have the kids back, and congratulations, Willie Hall. And what a great career and how many lives he's impacted over almost four decades. Yeah, it's a guy whose name is synonymous with that program. Absolutely. All right, thanks, Greg. I want to take you to some breaking news right now. Sky 12 over the scene of a house fire. Uh, this is west of the downtown area happening at West Martin and Frio. Yeah, not far from I-10 actually. And as we get a good overhead view here from Sky 12, you can see a ladder putting some the ladder truck putting some water on what looks like it may be a two story house. Uh, a lot of apartments in that area too. It's kind of hard to make out, but you can see it is a fire, at least in the roof area right now. I don't see anything in any of the lower areas, but they are attacking it from above right now. A lot of smoke, and if you're on I-10 near downtown, you're probably seeing, uh, seeing the smoke rising into the air tonight. Again, this is near West Martin and Frio Street, not far from I-10. We're going to continue to monitor the situation. I want to check back in with that breaking news that we just showed you a few minutes ago. Here's another shot from Sky 12, but they are on the scene at this hour of, an, of a house fire. We don't have a whole lot of information on this particular fire. We can tell you it's in a residential area, and as you can see, there are several firefighter units on scene. Yeah, again, this is not far from I-10. It's West Martin and Frio Street is the, the major intersection, but it, again, you get a good idea there. You can still see the flames very much still active in what looks like the attic of this building. We'll continue to monitor the situation. Well, tonight, a sobering assessment about the coronavirus pandemic from Dr. Anthony Fauci, calling its rapid spread across the globe, quote, his worst nightmare, end quote, and warning it isn't over yet. 21 states and Puerto Rico now seeing cases on the rise. ABC's Ramina Puga has more tonight. As states and cities continue to reopen, the coronavirus pandemic isn't slowing down. In a recent interview, Dr. Anthony Fauci compared the pandemic Just to his worst about. nightmare. In a period of four months, it has devastated the world, and it isn't over yet. Arizona's health department told hospitals to activate their emergency plans because cases are rising. We need to really be um, socially responsible when we go outside socially distance. You know, I think there's evidence that we're not doing that. 21 states and Puerto Rico registered a rise in COVID and 14 states, including Arizona, have seen their highest seven day average growth since the pandemic began. Those growth numbers could be attributed to more testing, but several states are also seeing an uptick in hospitalizations. You know, right now we're fine, but if we continue at a, at, at a rate like this, we're facing a significant chance that we're going to have to shut down the state again. COVID-19 hospitalizations in Texas are up 36 percent since Memorial Day. North Carolina currently has 774 coronavirus patients in its hospitals, setting a record for the fourth time this June. Meantime, states continue to seek normalcy. Miami beaches reopen Wednesday, along with NASCAR next week, which is planning to have 1,000 service members be the first fans in the stands. And the World Health Organization clarifies its statement on asymptomatic spread, saying it's very rare for people who test positive but never develop symptoms to infect others. This does not refer to pre-symptomatic patients who just haven't shown symptoms yet. In Colorado, Romina Puga, ABC News. Believe, I believe that a change is gonna come. In Houston this afternoon, a final farewell for George Floyd. During his funeral, he was described as a star high school athlete in two sports with the big smile and sense of humor. His family described him as a loyal friend and a protector. As the funeral came to a close, his family began the funeral procession. Floyd was buried next to his mother. History untold. It's a new series here at KSAT as the push for education in how this nation's history has led up to where we stand today. The fight against racism continues even after the abolishment of slavery centuries ago and desegregation that was enacted only decades ago. Right now, a team of about 40 historians and researchers are hoping to help others explore crucial pieces of history often left out of textbooks. As Devin Clark reports, they've created a new school curriculum. It's part of our new series, History Untold. We have over 3,000 
original images that many people have never seen before. Black History 365, an inclusive account of American history, is the name of a new school curriculum being offered in hard copy format and through digital and interactive platforms. BH365 CEO Dr. Walter Milton Jr. says it chronicles black history. And we start off in ancient Africa, uh, sort of the beginning of time, and then we come all the way up to contemporary history. From the role of African civilizations to the George Floyd incident in Minnesota and pivotal events in between, co-founder Dr. Joel Freeman says the coursework focuses on historic moments that have shaped the climate of our nation today. Tuskegee Syphilis Project that has caused a lot of mistrust in the African American community. Uh, we had just the lynchings, uh, Jesse Washington um, in, in um, in Texas, uh, just uh, half the half the town came out. BH365 Media Relations Director Carlene Brown explains the coursework also includes a musical component. Because as we engage students around their local history, they too now are helping us to unearth and inform African American history in a way that we all haven't had the opportunity to do. Those involved say it's important to understand the past to create a better future for all. We want to be intentional in terms terms of helping young people have the skill sets so that they can really be solutionists. Black History 365 is expected to be adopted by more than a dozen schools, mostly throughout the Dallas area by this fall. More schools throughout the state and nation are expected to jump on board in the future. Tomorrow we continue our series, History Untold. Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. It's a segment in the show we call KSAT Q&A, where we have a conversation with somebody that's making news, an expert in the field. We take your questions and our questions to that person. We are pleased to be joined by San Antonio Police Chief William McManus live now on Zoom. Chief, thank you for joining us. And my first question is, you have been very outspoken from the beginning about what you thought about what happened to George Floyd. Talk about that a little bit. I have been, and in, 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 in all my years of policing, I don't think I've ever seen anything so quite as outrageous as uh, what happened to Mr. Floyd at the hands of those officers. Um, uh, it certainly sparked outrage, not only in this country, it sparked outrage throughout the world. And um, I think that the, the, the uh, tide is turning here where I think everybody's ready to do something about it. One of the things that we need to push uh, very hard for is for these collective bargaining agreements across the country uh, to be looked at. And I think that um, the only way that they're going to begin to change is if our elected officials take it up in Austin uh, to try and um, um, do something about Chapter 143, uh, Chapter 174. Uh, and then look at the collective bargaining agreements themselves. Now, now, Chief, you just mentioned, you know, these police union contracts. There's also been a lot of discussion about also defunding the police. When you hear that, when you hear calls for that, what's your reaction to that? Well, I think that, that, that there's, I've read a lot of different um, um, iterations of defunding the police. The one I read uh, most recently was that, uh, things that police are doing that uh, are not typically uh, responsibilities of law enforcement, such as dealing with the mentally ill, dealing with the homeless. I think the idea that, that was expressed in the article I just read was that the money that funds the police to deal with those, those particular areas would be directed to other more appropriate agencies to deal with it. So that's my latest understanding of defunding the police. Talk about the changes that you'd like to see. And I, you started with the collective bargaining agreement. So maybe let's talk about that fact that that you can discipline an officer for any number of things. But for the average person at home, I don't know that they realize that that discipline doesn't always stick because of the collective bargaining agreement and because of some of the things, the, the appeals and some of the processes that the department has to go through, correct? It, it, that's correct. And um, collective bargaining agreements actually, and, and state laws actually protect the bad officers. We have a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of very, very good officers, and that doesn't affect them at all. But but the officers who would engage in excessive force and other 
types of misconduct, uh, state laws, and, and collective bargaining agreements actually contribute to to the misconduct. And, um, you know, when, when um, officers who are terminated or, or actually disciplined in any way uh, in, in, by ways of by way of a term a uh, suspension they have the right to um, call for an independent uh, for, for an arbitrator to review the case so um, as far as I'm concerned if um, when consequences for misconduct are not certain and final which means you know this is going to happen to you if you do this if you do X, Y, or Z, and you know that if you do it and this happens to you, the outcome is going to be final. There's going to be no arbitrator to give you your job back. So um, when that doesn't happen, we are stuck with bad police officers. Chief, systemic racism exists in this country. That much is a fact. My question to you is, to what degree does it exist within our local police department? Well, I'll give you an example of, of how we try to address that. Uh, back in 2016, we hired uh, Dr. Lori Friedel uh, from the University of Florida, I believe she, she is uh, affiliated with. And she is the subject matter expert in implicit bias. So we had her come up here and for two days, uh, myself, the command staff, members of the community, members of the, the city city management team took that implicit bias course. After that two days, the next training session was for um, training the trainers. And then we put our, our entire department through implicit bias training to address exactly what you're talking about. Talk about the fact that yeah, I, I, I want to give this final question to you from a personal level. I mean, you've been police chief in Minneapolis. You worked on the force in Washington, D.C. We've seen a lot of those streets with protesters and looters and rioters. What's your message for the community tonight and for you, what are your emotions personally when you see what's happening in some of these streets and cities that you know well? You know, it, it, it hurts the 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 protesters that are out there trying to to um, to send a message to government, to the police departments, um, that that they're not going to tolerate this. Uh, when when protesters um, start to destroy property, uh, start to assault people, that takes away from the true message of the people who are protesting for a righteous reason. And so I I, I think that. And talking with some of the, some of the leaders of the um, of the of the marchers and the and the protesters, they have said that they believe that the most of the violence is behind us, and that if if they believe that any further violent protests will be uh, small in nature, and uh, I, I hope they're right. My my feeling is that they are. Uh, it's been very quiet since um, since last week. And uh, we've we've dropped the curfew. Uh, we've opened up Alamo Plaza in the evening. So my hope is that we can continue to dialogue, uh, and the protesters can continue to exercise their First Amendment rights uh, in in response to what happened to Mr. Floyd. San Antonio Police Chief William McManus, thank you so much for your time and for your perspective. Thank you. You're Chief. welcome. We'll be right back. All right, we're continuing to monitor that fire that's just west of downtown. The fire department uh, basically seems to have a pretty good handle on this right now. You can see the ladder truck is still up there, but we're not seeing the flames that we saw just moments ago. Yeah, certainly some good news. Our Jaffney Gray just arrived on the scene. And Jaffney, what are you learning about what kind of structure this is and what have fire officials told you so far? So fortunately, so far, we've heard that there are no injuries were reported, but I want to take you a look again. If you look up there, the fire ladders, they've been up this entire time. Literally, they just turned their water off. So I'm assuming that they have it under control. When we first got to the scene, we could see flames from across the parking lot. And uh, of course, it's, it's just been, it's been kind of crazy. If you look around, you'll notice that everything is blocked off at this time. If you're driving around, if you're out and about, please 
please avoid this area. Again, we're right here at West Martin and Leona. So again, fire crews, they're hard at work. I'm pretty sure they're putting out hot spots right now. But again, they just turned the water off of the ladder trucks right at this time. But again, so far, again, only thing we know is that it's an abandoned residential structure and that no injuries have been reported. All right, Jaffney, thank you for that update. And again, an abandoned residential structure. Uh, it, it's Frio and Leona is what she's, or West Martin and Leona, mm -hmm. not far from Frio Street to give you kind of an area where we're talking about. We'll be right back. Take a live look outside with live cam. All is quiet out there in the Alamo City, the end to a uh, hot and humid day. But we made it. Yes, we made it. We made it through <laughs> the humidity, and there is some relief out there right now, Adam. Yeah, already a big drop in humidity, at least locally and northwest of town. And overall, it's not going to be quite as uh, hot and sticky here for the foreseeable future. So say goodbye to the humidity. Cooler mornings are ahead when we have the drier air. Well, we cool off more efficiently at night, and that's going to lead to some cooler mornings actually running below average. However, we're going to be sunny and dry. No chance of rain in the foreseeable future here. We have some showers now down south and that's it. We're going to cut the tap off and turn it off, unfortunately, for uh, at least seven days here. So look at the big change in our dew points here. Just compared to this time yesterday, it's already dropped 21 degrees in San Antonio compared to this time yesterday, 41 degree drop in Rock Springs. You look at the readings right now and we clearly have that cold front draped across South Texas. New Braunfels still muggy at 74, but the front has moved through San Antonio. The dew point of 52, Uvalde 48, but Carrizo Springs at 72. So that very muggy air is still out there, especially south and east of San Antonio. But this front will gradually be dropping its way southward and pulling in that drier, less humid, more comfortable air for everybody by first thing tomorrow morning. Temperatures right now. 80s, 70s, and even some 90s still out there. 90s southwest of town, Catula and Carrizo Springs, but some lower 70s already in the hill country and 84 in San Antonio measured at the airport. So a few little showers did pop up earlier today along the boundary, the little cold front or not as hot front, not as humid front, whatever you want to call it. And now we do have some thunderstorms down to the south and even this storm just turned severe on us. Potential for some inch in diameter hail about the size of a quarter and maybe a quick wind gust of 50 to 60 miles per hour. Uh, so this is drifting southward right along I-35 moving through Dilly as we speak. It has dropped some good rainfall. Unfortunately, now it may have some larger hail associated with it. That seems to be the primary threat with this as it drops southward. Uh, that's moving away from San Antonio and this is it. This is it for the rain. This activity is coming to an end tonight and then we're looking very dry. But look at the rainfall already from that one thunderstorm that's building and drifting southward just east of I-35 from Pearsall to Dilly, about two inches of rain estimated from that downpour. As we get into tomorrow morning, sunshine for everybody, 66. Then 85 at noon and 92 for the high temperature. That's an average afternoon high for this time of year, but the morning low running below average. Our average low is 72. Low humidity all day long, not as uh, hazy out there either. More of a crisp baby blue color to the sky. We'll be in the low to mid 90s the rest of the week into the upcoming weekend. Pretty much putting on the weather on cruise control here and morning low temperatures uh, coasting in the mid 60s. So we're looking at more cover, more comfortable and pleasant mornings as a result of that lack of humidity. Looking forward to it. Thanks so much, Adam. The Tokyo Olympics have been delayed, but that doesn't mean athletes are putting their workouts on hold. The inventive way one athlete is training for 2021. It's coming up next. The San Antonio Zoo experiencing a quarantine baby boom. They've had a number of new additions born in captivity while the pandemic forced closures. The birds included several animals, including twin lemurs. It has been more than 30 years since the zoo has had a birth of a black and white ruffed lemur. Our web team is keeping track of the coronavirus pandemic with the latest numbers and the many efforts underway to help our community through this trying time. It's all online at KSET.com. 
And the San Antonio Zoo isn't the only facility that's had activity during the coronavirus lockdown. The Paris Zoo reopened yesterday with 62 new residents. Baby baboons, penguins, flamingos, ring-tailed lemurs were all born at the zoo during its three-month closure. Zookeepers say the lockdown did not change the animals' habits, but workers did miss the, vis the visitors. All right, with the Tokyo Olympics postponed until 2021 because of the coronavirus pandemic, Athletes have had to find new ways to stay in shape. This is Argentina wild water canoeing racer Sebastian Rossi. He chose training in his girlfriend's swimming pool. Now, you don't see it here, but he keeps the canoe strapped to those pair of palm trees behind him while he paddles vigorously in the water. I guess it's not that bad an idea. It's not the same as being in the wild, but Rossi says it's better than nothing. You got to give him props for the creativity. I do. Yes. Yeah. At first, I was and like, that looks like a workout. Yeah, I'm like, he's not even get many laps in that pool, <laughs> but you know. Question. Whoa, is that a canoe or a kayak? That's uh, a good question. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It looks suspect to me, but <laughs> you think it's a kayak? Uh, it looks more like a kayak. I don't know. What's the difference? That's what I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> they steer differently. That's for sure. You steer from the rear in the canoe. Okay. Oh, hey, sunny, dry. 60s and 90s. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. Now I have to do Google. I know. I'm trying to figure it out. <laughs> That's it for the night beat. GMSA at 4.30 in the morning. Good night.